Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blesses you. I want you to turn with me to your Bibles. I'm going to look at a few verses and then I'm going to share my heart. And I'm going to start off in the book of Amos, chapter 9. But first, I want to tell you a story, and the story is there's this guy, and he was reading the scripture in the book of James, and he, um, he was from the south and um, <laughs> didn't have the best reading comprehension, and as he was reading the book of James, it says, you have not because you ask not, because when you ask, you ask Amos, and this person actually had, it's a true story, he had a television, I'm sorry, a radio program, and he created an entire message on you have not. Because you ask not, and when you ask, you're asking Amos. You see, that's the problem. You shouldn't be asking Amos. You should be asking Jesus, because Jesus is the one, not Amos. Some of you didn't laugh because you don't know your Bibles. <clears throat> wow. Okay, that was fun. We're going to have some fun today, loosen up a little bit. For me, studies, as we dive into the book of Acts, I'm going to actually take a mini-series within the book of Acts. All right, You're going to see why. So Amos chapter 9, verse 11, in that day, walls from the ruins, I will rebuild it and restore it, its former glory. And then it says, and Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken and he will do these things. So I'm going to lead us somewhere, but I want to start off and say, what in the world's that? In the last days, God's going to rebuild one house and it says he's going to rebuild David's fallen tent. Now, there's tons of teaching on the tabernacle of Moses. You can find it everywhere. I've studied as a young man. I had had teachers and professors, and and that was the main revelation was the outer court and the inner court and the holy of holies and studying all the cubits, and people are all trying to figure out by the cubits when Jesus is returning. I don't believe that's the purpose of that, but anyway. and, and, And just the study of the tabernacle of Moses, but most people have no clue about the tabernacle of David. But before we dive into the understanding of the tabernacle of David, because this is what God says he's rebuilding. God is rebuilding something, and it's this. Don't you want to know what it is? We should. We should really want to know what it is, because it's amazing. First thing that I want to um, unpack for you is this is what I'm asking God to give me. And it's a heart like David. And when you study the scriptures, you see that David, he wasn't perfect. I think that's important for for most of us to understand as Christians is that God's not looking for your perfection. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. It is not because of my obedience that I'm righteous. It's because of his obedience and my faith in him that I stand as righteous. Did that make sense? Religion tries to make it all about you. What I see in the life of David is a real man. And and, and I'm going to unpack this. And it's funny. I had a conversation recently I'm getting older, man, because some people are using terms like, oh, so you're talking about authentic masculinity, not toxic masculinity. Go get a life. What are you talking about? Listen, I will never be seeker sensitive. I will never try to make all of you feel super comfortable. That is not my job. As As a teacher and a prophet of the word of the Lord, it's to bring correction and reproof and admonition and to inform you of the word of God. It's not to make a seeker sensitive environment. Are you kidding? That is not my job. You should be sitting here uncomfortable like. (laughs) As the Holy Spirit begins to adjust things in you, you're not, we live in the world, but we're not supposed to be a part of it. And so when I look at the life of King David, the first thing that I see is, you know, he's a man after God's own heart. And I want to encourage you guys, he grew up past being a shepherd and just playing music among the sheep. Sometimes when I hear people teach on David, they have this depiction of David, and he's still a young boy, and he's just singing, how he loves us, oh, how. and he's just this little boy, and we just want to be like David as a worshiper. Well, there is an element of David, but when you understand, number one, that he was a shepherd, and he was the youngest of his brothers, if you understand contextually, being a shepherd was one of the most dangerous jobs of that day, because they had to protect the sheep from the lions and the bears. So the fact that Jesse had David protecting 
the sheep means they probably didn't have a good relationship. Some would even believe when it says, in sin did my mother conceive me, that the reason why Jesse did not invite David to the party when Samuel was anointing kings was because it wasn't his kid. All right, there's, there's, has anybody ever hear that before? Come on, church. And so, here David is out there in essence, it's like take your 12, 13-year-old son and put him out in the most dangerous job ever. So David was not a coward. And yes, he was a worshiper. But we see the presence and the power of God on the life of David his whole life. But he eventually grows up and he becomes like equivalent to one of our Navy SEALs. He, he is a warrior at the top. When David walks in the room, I'm just ad-libbing here because, you know, my background and, and a lot of you here, guys, you know, is martial arts, boxing, kickboxing, grappling, so on and so forth. And, and when you walk into a school or a gym and a new guy walks in, you are measuring him up. You're measuring, can I take him or am I sitting out this round? <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm going to use the bathroom when that guy is looking for somebody to spar because he's, you know. But that's, that's what men often do in those environments among warriors. So here's David. If he just walked in like, hey, boys, come on. We're going to attack the Philistines. That's, I promise you that when David walked in the room, they said, shh, shh, stop, stop, stop. stop, stop. David's here, David's here, David's here. And David walked in and said, I was spending time with my God. You know, you know the most important thing for a man or woman after God's own heart? It's time spent with the presence. I want to encourage you. I, I, oh, Lord, help my heart because, you know, I saw something as I was preaching last week. And, 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 and it happens to me when I travel and I come home. Is, is, is I'm, when I'm traveling, I, I'm operating in the prophetic anointing. And that's what I'm invited to do. And then I come home and I start seeing. And then I just crack it and then everybody gets offended. Um, but there's so much loneliness here. People are so lonely. In our valley, there's this huge thing of loneliness. And so when we gather together as a church, we want to hang out. Potluck, fellowship. Listen, the first priority as a believer when you gather in this place, I don't care, gather somewhere else and do it. In this place, it's to honor the king. Did you know you have a king that you're worshiping? And you would not come into the presence of the king, chit-chat with somebody else and distracting them from his glory. We need to be a people that restore the fear of the Lord and honor for Jesus. I want to encourage you, Sunday is not for everything. What are you doing on Saturday? Make friends on a Tuesday. Have a coffee on a Wednesday. Can you give God one day? Can you give him 30, 40 minutes of undivided attention without trying to get attention for yourself? Church. I'm telling you, I've been around the world and I've seen revivals. And one of the one, number one characteristics is the people that don't give a rip about anybody in the room, but they need to spend time with their God. They say, well, I spend time with God all the time. Stop it. Then, you, then your shadow would be healing the sick. When I get around you, I feel like I want to burn for Jesus. And I believe that was what you see of David, is that there was something different about him. He's hanging out with a bunch of dudes. Warriors, and he walks in the room, and when he gives a charge, shh, they listen. And we're talking about David's mighty men were mercenaries, and they were those that were fleeing from crime, some of them, in order to find solace in the caves of Adullam. So I want you to shift the thinking of if I want to be a man after God's own heart, I have to be very feminine. Guys, I have no feminine parts. That part was taken, Eve. It belongs to my wife, okay? I have emotion, but I'm not feminine. I, I want to help you understand. God created me man, and I think like a man, and I act like a man, I believe like a man, and he loves that. And if we try to make everybody feminine, then we're not going to have masculine fathers. We're not going to have warriors that, that contend for something. For Everyone is just trying to be at peace with everyone. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. There's a difference between a peacekeeper who, who wants to, please don't bring up other religions while you're teaching. I bring in the lost friends here, and I don't want them to get offended. You know what happens when somebody gets in a real, authentic environment? Is they go, I like that. Only people that are offended are the religious people. People that want God are like, say that, that hurt my feelings. You hurt my feelings, I liked it. Because I'm going to go home, I'm going to, listen. 
There's Zechariah chapter 10 says there's coming a day where you'll no longer be called sheep, but you'll be called war horses. What are the days among us? A war horse was trained for battle, and it was powerful. However, it was specifically chosen and developed and trained to be meek. Meekness means power under control, under restraint. So when people are yelling and screaming, the, meat, the war horse is focused. David was a, a man's man. He, he was passionate. He loved God, and, and he saw God do so many miracles in his life. And out of a heart of worship, remember David, when he was a young man, they put him in the Saul's council. And the Bible says that when David played the harp, the demons left Saul. So, so, so I want you to understand this because it's like trying to teach somebody whose tummy's full about hunger. Fast for three days. And as you fast, then you'll understand hunger. Right? Or go to a third world nation. One time I went to Africa. My son Isaiah and I were going to Africa. Listen, my sweet wife had me all packed up with goodies. I had beef jerky, peanuts, you know what I mean? Protein bars. I got it in my bag. After every little trip, I'm sitting out. <laughs> my little pudgy self, and I see this young man who's my translator, and he was like sleeping, and my energy is, what you experience of me right now is actually me holding myself back. It's, I'm intense. And so I'm like, this is my interpreter, so I'm like, God wants to be healed today. And he's like, that boy, yeah, 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 boy, yeah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, wake up, you know. Anyway, I wanted to say that, but I, I still love people. And so I get in the car, and I'm like, Holy Spirit, what's wrong with him? And the Lord says, he hasn't eaten today. I so, like, uh. so I go, hey, I, got, I started giving him food. Man, he was the best interpreter ever. Sometimes you have to be starving in order to understand hunger. See, sometimes like David, you have to be put in the position where you have a demonized king who wants to murder you, and the only thing that brings relief to the demonized king is worship. Some of us don't understand that. Why did we worship for so long? And then this guy gets up here and starts shaking the cage again. I tell my wife, listen, God's called me to be a pusher. She's like, more like a hot red poker. You just poke people constantly. That's why I always say I'm not a traditional fivefold pastor. My heart isn't just to go, come on, everybody. It's to go, come on, get equipped, get your shields, get your swords. Now let's go change the world. It's not just enough for me that we fill the room and with exuberance. It has to be exuberance encountering Jesus and transforming the city around us. you got to leave here, people, and go bring the kingdom everywhere you go. But David, he was put in these positions where his only respite, relief, was prayer and worship and the presence. This was for real for him. Maybe some of you haven't experienced this. Maybe some of you haven't experienced family crisis where, where doctors say there's no hope or, or you're struggling with a child and the only thing you could do is kneel by your bedside and weep. Maybe you've never experienced that before, but when you have, you realize, I need God. But I don't want you to get to where you have to have a crisis in order to need God. If not, you're already deceived. You need him to wake up this morning. You needed his, some of you, you, you thought you lost your keys and your phone and you're just thinking, and it was an angel that moved it away from you because he knew if you would have left five minutes earlier, you got in a car accident. God is constantly watching over his children. We need him. David was actually forged in the fire where worship and the presence of God was his answer. And so we see the story where King David, he, I shared this before, where now he's the king, and he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which is the symbol of the presence of God, back to Jerusalem. And we, you remember the story. If not, I shared it a few weeks ago. And so he brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And now what happens? I want you to understand something. The tabernacle of David looked like this. It was on Mount Zion, little mountain, not Oregon mountains, Jerusalem mountains, Mount Zion, David's house, a tent, the Ark of the Covenant, and the flame of God. That was it. You have to understand why this is so crazy, because Tabernacle of Moses, only the high priest could go, 
You know, well, you have the outer courts and everybody can hang out in the outer courts, right? Outer courts is when people come to church, they just want to chill, just want to talk, hang out. Hey, what's up, dude? Did you see the news the other day of Obama, uh, Trump? And, and, th and this is outer court fellowship. And this, everybody could come to the outer court. So bad was the outer court eventually under the Pharisaical time, Jesus' time, where they were selling things, merchandising things in the outer court. Outer court, anybody can come. There's not real sacrifice. It's like, hey, I sinned. Here's a little dove. Got the blood of the dove. You go home, you feel a little better. But then the next level was the inner court. And this was the place of the candlestick and the bread and the, and the lampstand. This represented a deeper devotion to God. This is now somebody not just out here in the fellowshipping world. This is someone who actually wants a relationship with Jesus. Yes, I'm saved. There's the brazen altar here. I'm saved. I ask for forgiveness. But now I want to know him. I want to go deeper with him. So, so I'm, I'm trying. There's a candlestick. And it's the fire of the Holy Spirit that burns inside of me. So on and so forth. The bread of his presence. But only one person could enter behind the veil once a year. And it was the high priest. And the high priest, priest would enter behind the veil. But before he did that, he had the censer. If you've ever been to a Catholic service, you've seen some of this. Where they go like this in the smoke. Here's the, here's the veil. That guy is going with as much of the coals from the altar of incense. Puts it in there. Smoke is coming out. And he is trying with everything in his power. He's shaking that thing as much as he can to get the smoke to fill. Because his desire was when I go in there... I want to make sure I'm atoned for. My sins would be covered. That the cloud of smoke is covering. For the <laughs> and then the story goes, it's not actually biblical. You can't actually find this, where that they would die and then they would get pulled out. Some of that is extra biblical. But, but, they, but they were trying so hard to cover the ark once a year. Now, David, he recovers the ark of the covenant, and he tells Zadok the priest, Go up to Gibeah in the high place and continue to offer God the burnt offering, the candlestick, replace the bread. Do the rituals because that was holy unto the Lord. I just want God in my house though. Here, let me give you an example. Take me past the outer courts. Is that it? No, too old. <laughs> to priest. And he's doing all the work, the sacrifices, the burnt offerings. He's coming here. He's changing. Uh, the veil, and there's no ark. The ark of the covenant, the manifest presence of God, represented God himself. That's so much like many of us. Where church is just, well, for some people, it's not even a thing anymore. <laughs> How many of you know you want to obey the Lord? Whether you like it or not, what if he says, do not forsake assembly? I want to obey God, but I don't assemble. Whether you're already disobeying in that one area. Because it's not about you. I don't get anything out of church. When was it ever about you? What about community? What about strength? What about all of your wisdom and all of your experience lending it to somebody in need? What about showing up when it's not about you with a word for someone, with a word of knowledge for healing? Maybe you're making, doing a little good this week. You got $20 extra. Maybe you come in and look for somebody to bless. That's community. That's family. Come on. So what's happening here is this, this kind of ritual, which I want you to understand I'm teaching prophetically because it was holy to God. It was his idea. But... David's tent is over here. While these guys are just going through the motions, the songs of Moses were just a few. David, all of the psalms, most of the psalms were penned as he's looking out of his window at the living Shekinah glory of God. I want you to understand how profound this is. King David goes, I know that the traditional way is the blood of bulls and goats. That you can never enter into the presence of God without some kind of sacrifice. But I have an idea. Let's just try it. Remember how Uzzah touched the ark and died? David said, I have an idea. Maybe we could offer the sacrifice of praise. Could you imagine being that first round of people? You're like, if I die, bro, you get the, you get the gun, all right? You get my, you get my moped. <sighs> Seriously, got to think about it in context. And then they're like, oh, hallelujah, God, you're worthy. The fear. Now, but the ark of the covenant represents the throne. The kingdom, the symbol of God's presence and his power among people. And David realized that if you just surround the throne or the ark with the worship and the presence of God, 
that actually God wasn't killing anyone. What was happening was David was having encounters. David was experiencing his presence. His heart was becoming more holy. The people were becoming more joyful. The people were singing songs to God. They're praising God. They're stalling the Lord. Did you know? Because I've been asking this. Why, why's the singing part? Well, it's interesting. Even if it wasn't church, Christianity, worship, we get into a room together. We all sing the same song. First thing that happens is dopamine is released. I want, you to, I want you to think about how brilliant God is. The scripture says, it is the spirit of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Heaviness could be depression, feeling heavy, feeling torn down. So what I like to do sometimes when I'm able to is study scriptures and then try to find some scientific backing. Did you know if you're struggling with depression, now there are some times where you got to go get medically checked because it could be hormones and imbalances and so on and so forth. But for some of us, the depression isn't that. It's just that we forgot to praise. Woke up in the morning, said this dang bed all night. I was squeaking. Get up and get the coffee. Look at this old coffee pot. You know, and you put your shoes on. I hate these shoes. And all these pants are too tight. I, dang it. And, you, and, you, and then you're struggling with depression. Duh. You're focused on the negative. You're actually feeding yourself what you don't have. Versus waking up first thing in the morning. Jesus, you're on the throne. You're worthy. You're good. I love you. Thank you for a roof. Happy pot. Yeah, Jesus. There's something about spirit of praise. Why do people have addiction? Addiction is a dopamine chase. All kinds of addictions release this thing called dopamine. We naturally have it in our body. And it's released when you just show up to church on a Sunday morning. But guess what? People would rather stay home depressed. It takes some energy sometimes. Some of you don't know depression. Some of you know a lot about depression. Depression isn't just I'm sad. If you're just feeling sad, that's something different. True depression is I feel nothing. Clinical depression is not happy, not sad. I'm numb. I am just numb. Happy, sad, we all have ups and downs. How many of you know that? Right? We all got a little crazy in us. <laughs> we all have a little stuff we got to work through. It's part of humanity. But what if God, in his wisdom, created some foolish thing where you gather together and you just go, worthy, 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 and all of a sudden, you're singing in unison with a group of people First thing that happens is dopamine is released, and you start to feel happy. That's why it's important that you enter his courts, how? With praise. And, and I know worship leaders struggle with this a lot of times because we want to go deeper because oftentimes the, the worship leader, the musicians, they know the power of deep, intimate worship. But it's kind of like this. All right, everybody, good morning. I know some of you just woke up. On the way here, you had an argument with your spouse. You were yelling at your kids. Now you walked into the church, deeper, deeper still. And you're like, I'm not there. I need some positive, encouraging K-love. I need, I, need, I need this is how I fight my battles so I don't go home and get a fist fight with somebody else, right? It's just, it's just, it's just listen, what you do alone in, with Jesus, yes. For me, a lot of times the music I listen to when I'm alone, it doesn't have lyrics. I don't want to get distracted by the lyrics. Or I listen to Soki music by Kimberly and Alberto Rivera. I have my own flow. But corporately, it isn't about me. It is about getting everybody on the airplane together. Once you're all on the airplane together, which how do you know you're on the airplane together? Could you imagine being the worship leader? This, this is a shift perspective. Though. Don't get defensive. Try not to get defensive, okay? Here's Rob, and he's just singing his heart out, just, just like, he's just been spending time in prayer and heart abandoned to Jesus, and he looks out, and people are just like, get a life. It's one of the most frustrating things as a worship leader, and the worship leaders, these guys are here multiple times a week practicing, they're here like 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. And then they leave and they're so discouraged. Why are you discouraged? Nobody was engaging. Now, we all know what's truth. We shouldn't be doing it for a response from the people. But come on, help a brother out. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm preaching in Brazil right now. There's like 60 people in the room. I see everything you're doing. 
You know what I mean? So I leave here, and Erica's like, how'd it go? I'm like, well, three people were sleeping. <laughs> how do you sleep? I'm loud. So, so what that tells me is that people haven't had to face suffering like David. Or maybe you're in a good season. You're in that Deuteronomy 8 season where his money, houses, I'm doing good. I don't need God. Look at these new shoes. And you're not in a place of understanding that our heart should be continually before God in a place of humility. Just continually before God in a place of humility. Lord, I know you're with me and I know you're in me, but I want more of you. See, that's what began to happen in David's fallen tent, was that the people now, it wasn't so much about, I want to be careful how I say this, because I do want to be biblically accurate in my preach. But where the high priest was the only one to access the Holy of Holies, now it wasn't so much broken down into your social status or your lineage. Now it was Jerusalem, Jewish people come and worship. I hear my wife's voice in my head. The goal of a message is action, not just education. No? Well, I like it when you give me three steps and then I leave here and I don't do anything with them. But I feel smarter. Feel smarter. You know, the goal of a Sunday morning is an equipping center. Worship God. Give him the glory and the honor. He speaks to you. You speak to him. There's communion. There's infilling. Then you leave with action. In this realm of just, I want to read you a verse. It's in Psalms, and I get them wrong, 24 and 27. I think it's 27, the one I'm looking for, but they're both good. Let's go to Psalms 27. Where I was going to go, I'll go in a few weeks. Psalms 27 is King David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? There must be something going on in King David's life that he's got reason to be afraid. The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I'm attacked, I will remain confident. David, that sounds pretty intense. You're going through some stuff, buddy. What's the answer? What's your source? The one thing I ask of the Lord, this thing I seek the most, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when trouble comes. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of the reach on a high rock. And I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of, oh, but I'm going through so much. Then praise him, singing and praising the Lord with music. And then he goes on, be hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. Oh, David is giving you insight of his conversation with the Lord. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. And then he goes on and on and on. And I want to encourage you guys to, to read. But jump all the way down to verse 14. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. King David established, depending on the theologian, it's 33 to 40 years. There were simultaneous. The tabernacle of Moses was in operation along with David's fallen tent. Same time. I'm sorry, not, it wasn't fallen along with David's tent. They were going on at the same time. The only one God says he's building is the tabernacle of David. I want you to look at Acts chapter 15 with me as I bring this message to a close. You would think after 22 years I'd be better at speaking. My goodness. Perfect. Practice doesn't make perfect. I'm a living example of that. All right. Acts chapter 15. Let's just start in verse 12 because I think this gives, I mean, we could read the whole thing. But let me just go to verse 12 and I'll kind of share with you. Verse 6, Acts 15, verse 6. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve the issue. Uh, you'll see what the issue is in a minute. Let me go up to verse 4. <laughs> Sorry. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. Verse 5, but then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law. They stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach the Gentiles so they could hear the good spirit is starting to fill the Gentiles. I would say all of you in this room, you're Gentiles. This is good for us. 
After the meeting, a long enough discussion, Peter stood up, and then let's go verse 8. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that will neither that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? It's powerful. We believe that we're all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood up and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself, and this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophet predicted as it is written. You ready? Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I'll rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. Who made these things known so long ago? Look at verse 19. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Gentiles are starting to get baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're starting to get saved. The apostles don't know what to do because they're like, I thought the gospel was for the Jew first or for the Jew only. So they're having this conversation. And then James, the brother of Jesus, he gets up and he says, I know exactly what this is. This is Amos 9-11. What? Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit? Is Amos 9-11? It's David's fallen tent being restored? Absolutely. Why? Because David established a place for all mankind to seek God. When the tabernacle of David was erected, the neighboring villages that were at the bottom of the mountain could see them worshiping and singing and see the fire of God. How many of you know that the presence of God, the glory of God, the miracles of God, the prophetic voice of God isn't just for the church on a Sunday morning? Come on, sons and daughters of the Most High. When you fall madly in love with Him and you have this revelation, wait a minute. What is God building? He's building a place, a house of worship, a people of worship. He's not looking to build a third temple in Jerusalem. The only place it says that he is rebuilding a temple is right here. And the temple that he's building is you and I completely surrendered and we host the presence of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, it says that God, oh, Holy Spirit, help me remember the verse. We, we are being built up as a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. What if your eyes were open when you showed up on a Sunday and we're gathering together? And I want you to understand, don't be limited in your thinking. You're here in this room. There's 10,000 people in Redding, California worshiping. There's churches all around that are worshiping. What does God see on a Sunday morning? So many of us have given up on it. What does God see on a Sunday morning where there's Baptists and Lutherans and, and Catholics and, 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 and Anabaptists and whatever, Methodists, and they're worthy of our praise. Whew. And there's different cultures. And the highest, the Spirit of God, this is what happened in David's tabernacle, is the tabernacle of David was a New Testament type of church where it wasn't laws that ushered the presence of God, it was worship and prayer, a heart that was open before God. And the presence of God, shoo, was what brought transformation. People gathered and worship around what? The fire of the Holy Spirit. Not just around rules and regulations. Not just around programs. The living flame. Whew. I've asked this question. I'm a very purpose type driven guy. And I've asked God like, how did David... The scripture says in Acts chapter 13, 22, David was a man after God's own heart, and he fulfilled the purposes of, of, his, of God for his generation. So I want to fulfill the purposes of God after, for my generation. There's something God has me to do on the earth. I want to do it. How do I do it, Lord? <laughs> a heart of worship. See, something happens to us, saints, when we enter into the presence of the Lord and we learn how to be completely vulnerable before him. 
And we allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to begin to purify us, purge us, deal with things, encourage us, love on us. We leave his manifest presence, leave. We know he's always with us, but in that environment. And then we walk into other places, cultures, and we bring his presence with us. And we should look a little different than the last time I met you. How many of you know growth is not just a business uh, culture? As a kingdom-minded people, we should be continually growing. How? Into the image of our Lord Jesus. And this community, you're going to feel it, saints. I'm going to be pushing hard of getting a people to gather and just be completely abandoned for Jesus. You know what will happen? A lot of you won't show up next week. You say, that's not why I'm coming here. I'm coming here to pat my back, tell me you love me, pray for me, you know, whatever, give me money so I can do things. But what ha- that's good. Love you, bless you. There's a lot of churches that do that. But what happens when you have a realization that what's going to transform me is not getting the same advice from the same people or getting different advice from different people to try to get the answer you want to hear. But if I would learn, first and foremost, to connect with God, with my entire being, that the one who made me knows me. And he created me. And I could sit with my maker and I could tell him, you know what, God, I'm struggling with this. And then you see him and you go, I'm not struggling with anything. You are good. You are holy. I magnify you, God. I worship you, King Jesus. Be exalted in my heart. And then what happens after you see the glory of the Lord? Change me. Now, I can't believe he talked about toxic masculinity. I better I wonder if he believes that there's multiple genders. You don't talk like that when you walk into the throne room of heaven and you see the king of glory and everything becomes real. All of a sudden, you're not going to sit there and just debate other Christians. You don't have time for that. Drama is demonic. No, I want to encounter him. Why? Because when I spend time with him, I become a better husband. I become a better father become a better friend, I become a better leader. Jesus, I need you. Would you stand with me to your feet? I just want us to, I'm going to continue to dive in over the weeks to come on the tabernacle of David and helping people understand why praise, why worship, things that seem so simple, and yet they don't move our hearts. And as I was praying and preparing this message, for some reason this image kept coming up to me, and it was of a Muslim mosque where people were bowed down. And they bowed down seven times. And when I first got saved, I listened to a message of a, of a Christian man who was converted to, from Islam to Christianity. And the message was he was talking about his grandfather. And he said, most Christians think that Muslims only worship like that out of duty and obligation. He says, the truth is, is that my grandfather, even though I know he was deceived, he was passionate to worship what he believed to be true. He said, when I encountered Jesus and I knew that Jesus was the way to the Father and he was the true God and I came to church expecting that these people would worship more passionately, more intensely. They'd be more in love because they have the real God. They've discovered the one true one, the creator, the living one who is and moves and have our being, who's not making women wear burqas and be mistreated, but actually liberates people. Like these people are going to be on fire. And he shows up. And he's experiencing what most churches in North America are experiencing. We need more lights. We need more drums. We need more beats. We need just to get people moving. We might need to lock the foyer so people actually come in here and worship the Lord. We might need to have a pizza party next Sunday just to make people hungry to show up. Good night. It's exhausting. Why don't we just want him? It's become too familiar. We've become too familiar. We've become too familiar. I want to say something to all of you right now. Hear me. You don't have a ministry. I just want to do my ministry. I had this idea. So I started my own ministry. I don't have a ministry. We only have one ministry, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And if you're not humble, Holy Spirit's going this way, and you're going over here with your own ministry. There's one ministry. It's the ministry of Jesus. And if, the, if your ministry is bringing division, it's not the ministry of Jesus. Church. He loves when we gather in his presence. That's there. It says 
the scripture, God says, I loved to dwell at the gates of Zion. Zion is my dwelling place forever. What was Zion? It was literally a little hill, the ark, and God's people worshiping with no reservation. Just close your eyes with me, church. Father, I, I know what you're doing in me. You're saying, Ivan, come on, man. Worship me. Put your phone down. I had a rebuke recently from the Lord. He said, what do you get when you focus on church? I said, well, church. He says, what do you get when you focus on the kingdom? Oh, it doesn't say seek first the church. It says seek first the kingdom. And when you get caught up in church, you get caught up in problems, there's constant fires to put out. And what happens is it becomes a distraction from the main goal, which is hosting King Jesus. Gossip, slander, backbending. Kings have no time for that. Queens have no space for that. Complaining about it, not getting your way. That is not the kingdom. We need to seek the king. King Jesus. We say, turn it up, God. It's uncomfortable in a woke culture. But we want awakening. We want our hearts awakened. So let your fire come and burn. Let your fire come and burn in our hearts, God. You're worthy, oh God, of all of my worship. Just want to see your face, Lord. Just one touch of you. One encounter with my maker. I'm telling you right now, God's going to reshift some things in your hearts as you put him first. Plan B, plan C. <laughs> God, I thank you right now. We make you Lord. We make God's praise. Praise, I'm sorry. Praise and in, God inhabits the praises of his people. But the word there is actually tehillah. And it means spontaneous praise. So does any of you have a reason to praise God today? Let's just take a moment, not the worship team. Let's just begin to lift our voices in thanksgiving to the one who created me. He knows me. You formed us, God. You formed us in our mother's womb. And you know each one of us by name. And according to your word, you even put us where we're going to live. And you gave us unique giftings and callings. Brought our spouses. He chose what our kids would be like. God, you're amazing. You're incredible. And in those seasons where we feel lost, you speak to us. You say, This is the way. Walk in it. So, Jesus, all we have. I worship. Worship him, church. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blessed you. Subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about us, check us out at facebook.com slash ELC talent or check out our website www.empoweredlifechurch.org. Have a blessed week.